Welcome, welcome to our lunch and learn. We'll just leave it a, a little bit of time to let the rest of the people come in, but um, I'll be joined very soon by Lauren, Lauren Rowett and Le Les Kalisha from Yarra Trans. Okay, I think we'll get going. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land on which, which we meet today, or we're all over the place, but that's okay. And the peoples of the Kulin Nation. I also pay my respects to the elders past and present. As you know, each week we're talking to a different on-ground specialist. And this week we have Les Kalisha from Yarra Trans and Lauren will be talking to him. This session as always will run for 30 minutes and we'll have 10 minutes for the chat. So pop your questions in the chat um, and then we'll address them at the end. If we do miss any questions, we'll follow up. Um, this session will be recorded, so you can will be able to access this through our knowledge share from probably Monday. So I'll just ask Lauren to pop back in. Yay, <laughs> she's here. Um, all right, I'll let you have a chat to Les and I'll step out for a minute. Beautiful. Thanks very much, Cheryl. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lauren Rod. I'm the Industry Support Officer at Ecologic, um, and I'm joined today by Les Kulisha, um, who is the Principal Advisor for Network Development at Yarra Trams. Welcome, Les. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. Um, so today we're going to talk about an enhanced tram separation project that Yarra Trams undertook in the CBD. Les, can you tell us a little bit about, well, what an enhanced tram separation project is um, and then an overview of the project and what your role is within it? Sure. Um, thanks, Lauren. 
Well, first of all, the real the project really came about as a combination of a recognised need and opportunity. Um, yet, while zero harm is one of Yarratram's fundamental core values that we try to focus on, unfortunately, we still have somewhere in the order of a thousand vehicle to tram collisions each year in the five years leading up to the to the COVID pandemic. Um, and also, unfortunately, 40% of those occur on 15% of the network where notionally trams are operating in their own right of way. And in addition, 30% uh, of those are in the central Melbourne area. And when we looked at it even further, dug even further, we found that 13% just occurred on two corridors, namely Collins Street and Elizabeth Street. Wow. So it's, a, it's an issue that we were really um, looking to address. We progressively um, uh, attending to the network as we can under opportunities with tram track renewal. Um, recently, we've done William Street, Nicholson Street, other, other corridors such as Spencer Street, where we're able to lift the track, separate it more um, permanently from um, motor vehicle conflicts. But what we're aware of in, in the CBD, there's a lot of corridors where that opportunity hasn't presented itself and we really need to do something in the shorter term to address that safety risk. Um, the opportunity element really came about with um, the COVID pandemic um, and senior leaders from Yarra, City of Melbourne and DOT met and all agreed to jointly try to tackle that situation we were having. Collins Street itself um, had a low profile curb put in probably a decade or so ago and that was in a really poor state of repair um, and we really set out to see if we could do something about improving that operating environment. Um, we were also really pleased to see that Melbourne were progressing with the rollout of protected bike lanes in the, in the uh, municipality, which really um, provided the, the, the initial leverage and opportunity for us to progress with this, with this, this treatment. We basically saw that they were um, some positive elements being impl implemented along William Street. And part of that opportunity, Melbourne gave us that chance to also look at exploring an application as a complementary element on the alongside the tram tram tracks so that's where it kicked off um, the uh, decision was made to progress on um, trying to roll out um, at least three corridors initially in city of melbourne the state through dot um, found a funding source through the COVID stimulation opportunities and uh, that's where it all started. Fantastic. My, um, my role in the project was oh, to sorry. design development, sorry, just to continue on, um, to lead to the uh, design development on um, those, those works. Cool. Um, and so tell us a little bit about the, the, the recycled product that we're um, here to chat about today. Yeah, sure. So um, again, we, uh, we were very pleased. Yarra, Yarra generally is always on the uh, on the lookout for opportunities to, um, to basically to look at more sustainable products that we can use. You know, we're very socially environmentally aware, and so we're really pleased that the Orca curb, which was produced um, locally um, by Orca Civil, um, and they developed that a couple of years ago with uh, Deakin University that was locally manufactured, but it also used a high percentage of uh, recycled product, um, specifically a lot of recycled glass. So about 60, 60, about two thirds, 67% of the product is made up of recycled glass. And when we actually looked into it even further, we we're funny enough that part of that recycling glass also included old tram windows. So <laughs> it's a real, um, really good ex example of a real circular economy that we're recycling old tram windows into a curbing to try to avoid damaging more tram windows. So that was really pleasing. Um, Absolutely, it really, it's a really nice story about circular. Yeah, I love yeah. that, I love that element. Um, but Orca Civil were fantastic, um, particularly Ken Williams and Ellen Travis, and uh, they worked with us to modify the curbing that they'd been producing for City of Melbourne for the bike curbing to be more um, fit for purpose for our needs. We were conscious of, um, some of the other users and other the uh, requirements in relation to applying a curb in the city. Particularly, we had did some good work a couple of years back with the emergency services, all, all three, 
to come up with a curbing profile that achieved our purpose in separating vehicles, but was still um, forgiving from the point of view of emergency services being able to um, exit the tramways when they use those corridors. So we, dealt, we developed the curb, which was um, agreed to be 100 millimetres high, and it had a chamfered edge on the inner, inner side of the tram tracks. So um, we, Orca were really helpful in um, creating some moulds and we did some prototyping with different colours, which we then um, engaged with City of Melbourne to, to progress. Fantastic. So it was kind of a case of you kind of finding a supplier, I suppose, and then developing a product with them rather than kind of an off-the-shelf scenario. Yeah, exactly right. So, you know, again, got to give um, credit to City of Melbourne with the bike protected bike lane project because um, we really built on the positive outcomes that we were that, that was demonstrating. And we were looking for a product that was um, cost effective, um, sustainable, ideally, um, adaptable. So that was really key. We wanted something that was adaptable and readily um, changed and readily implemented. So we wanted something that we could put in and if it needed to change because of various um, access needs, that was easy to do so as well, rather than embedding it um, permanently into the road pavement. Fantastic. Um, so you mentioned the recycled um, glass that's in there. Is that kind of the, the main element of the recycled materials? Are there other things in there as well? Um, no, I think there's, um, there's also some mineral sands in there. I think there's 18% um, calcium carbonate, and then the remainder is um, an unsaturated polyester resin that binds it all together. Okay. And is that kind of a business as usual composition or is that something that's really quite innovative in this space? Um, it's probably an interesting one. I probably, I think it's quite innovative in that, you know, that's where Walker and Deacon combined, as I understand it, a couple of years ago to explore that capability. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they developed this product. They, you know, they've tested it. Um, I think it's about show to be four times as strong as um, conventional concrete. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, so uh, my understanding is that since our products gone in, let's call it our product, the tram separation curbing and the, and the bike curbs, there's been interest shown for um, a rollout or um, application interstate. And I think Orca sells, sounds like a sales pitch, but it's, <laughs> it's not meant to be. Um, <laughs> I've got no. I'm sure, they don't mind. <laughs> I'm just putting that. I've got no. I've got no um, affiliation with Walker in any way. But I also understand they also use using now material in manufacturing um, potentially pavers that might be applicable in areas as well. So that's fantastic. Um, so just in terms of stakeholders that you had to engage on the project. So you've spoken about obviously the supplier. Um, you have to work a lot with the city of Melbourne. You've got yourselves Yarra Trams. Um, and also the emergency services. How about contractors? Were they quite sort of open and willing to work with the product? Um, or was there, was there any sort of barriers or pushback at all? Yeah, like what really worked, I think, in, in the success of this project is that because we, we really had a, um, some tight timeframes to develop and roll out with expectations of uh, funding coming to, a, to an end at the end of the last, at the end of last financial year, um, what we did is we established a, um, a design, design development working group, and we had all the subject matter experts that we felt were relevant from um, DOT, City of Melbourne and Yarra Tramps, and we came together and workshopped those designs, both from the point of view of the, uh, the generic product, but then also specifically the application, corridor by corridor, you know, what sort of delineation, how, what sort of length should we put in, what sort of size gap should we put in, what do we do with circulation for uh, vehicles, access points? So, you know, we went through all that design process um, and that was uh, helped, uh, helped along and um, by Traffics Group who, who did the design element for us. And then the other element that was really critical was the actual installation. And we really had some, in that first application along William Street, we really had some good lessons learned. With the, with the product. And um, once again, with, along with Walker, we adapted some of that curbing. Initially, it was, some hollow, it was hollow in the middle. Um, and because we reduced the size of that Walker compared to the bike curb, it was more tended to be more brittle as a result of that ho hollowed section. Um, it also, um, so in making it solid, 
it firmed up that strength element, but it also provided some more um, adhesion on the surface. So that was one of the elements. But yes, um, just leading on to the installation, and that was a really key element as well. So we had Fulton Hogan as our um, installation contractor, and that was um, very important. They were, their professionalism and adaptability was fantastic. So they, they basically worked up a, an installation program where we had a rolling installation of a block each night, and that allowed tram services to maintain through the work site also allowed emergency services to go through the worksite as required. And it basically minimised that impact on the city because we weren't closing off long stretches of streets. We were just doing the block at a time and doing localised closures. Um, but um, Orca were also really fantastic in working with FH to make sure that the specifications in fixing, which were just as important as the material itself, um, were applied. So we, you know, the fixing screws and the adhesive and the epoxies so um, yeah, it was a really good team effort to get to get the works done in a, in a short time frame. So I think overall we did three corridors in the CBD um, in excess of five kilometres over about a two month period. So it was, it was yeah, good. wow, the silver linings of COVID, I guess, as well having exactly less right. traffic around to be able to do those sorts yeah, of that was a bonus. Would ordinarily yeah. be quite disruptive. Yeah, that was a real opportunity to get it in under the COVID conditions. Yeah, um, tell me so. They've not been in for very, too too long, obviously. But have you have you started to see a lot of um, improvements in their um, their performance compared to what your business as usual product would have been? Definitely, and I think you, you you sort of touched on the fact that it's probably unfair to compare the previous five years pre COVID um, to current conditions where um, traffic conditions were lighter. We're just starting to recover. So in relation to um, volume of, of vehicles coming through the city, um, we've already noticed a, obviously an improvement, um, but as I said, it's a it's very short period of time since the installation, um, you know, in the order of probably 50%, I'd say, in some corridors such as Elizabeth, it's up to 75% reduction at the moment. Um, the other sort of elements that we looked at, we got DOT to have a look at whether there was any, uh, or the extent of any adverse impacts on traffic throughput. Mm -hmm. And they did some Bluetooth analysis along Collins Street um, and found that it's very minimal. I think it's in the order of 3% thereabouts, the um, journey time or the speed, I should say, of vehicles through there. And that's primarily concentrated at that eastern end of Collins Street. On the western end, it's pretty much um, same sort of travel speeds as, as we had pre-installation. So all of those elements um, are, are very positive. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so in terms of any other barriers or challenges that you came up, like were there any other ones that you sort of came up against um, in getting the product approved for use um, and how did you overcome those? And in, you know, any, anything within installation or anything really? Well, I think we're quite fortunate because it is, it is you know, no, it's, not, it's not a trial. So we're not, we haven't got a period of time where we're saying we're set out to put this in for six months and then we'll remove it. Our intention is to, to you know, keep it there. Um, ultimately, it, it's, it's, it may change and becoming something more permanent. And that might happen as part of a streetscape upgrade project or um, a track renewal project. Then we probably look at um, making it a more permanent feature. Mm -hmm. um, but to date, I think fairly good, um, very good situation from the point of view of we haven't had to uh, replace too much of it. We have had some, some damage most of it's been alongside construction sites where there's been some more you know, heavy vehicle activity. But again, once again, the numbers, um, you know, we, in, it's in the order of maybe 20 units over the period of time. So it's quite minimal in the context of the amount of um, material that we've put out. Yeah, great. So your, your main lessons learned from the experience, you think? Um, I think the lessons learned are uh, really related to um, the importance of, of making sure that you get a product that's fit for purpose. And I think that we found that from the point of view of um, not just the material, but the fact that we were able to get that manufactured um, quite quickly. And I think, again, a big again, shout out to Orca because they really, um, to the party in relation to delivering on um, rollout. So they, you know, developed 
produced additional moulds and got more, more resources on board so that we could actually meet the delivery timeframes. Um, the same with FH, there was some days where, you know, it was bucketing down with rain overnight and I'd be, you know, making contact in the morning thinking, oh, I'm assuming you had no work carried out last night. It's like, no, nah, we're still out there installing it. So it was a commitment to get the works in place. Um, I think the other element was the strategic alignment between those organisations and the willingness and the, and the drive to get the works done. So everyone played their part. Very a lot of support from City of Melbourne team, DOT team, and the, and the Aerotrans team that sort of managed a lot of the um, the communication. We you know communicated with um, along the corridor, letting people know what we were doing. We communicated with any sort of driveways that may have had their access changed. So I think we. We did all the, the groundwork prior to it, and then that sort of assisted with the rollout, with the fishing rollout. And, you know, really, the extent of works that have gone in, the response has been um, pleasingly quite positive. There's been the odd, you know, adverse reaction, but overall it's been a positive response to the installation. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, and so Yarra trams at this stage, they don't actually have a formal recycled first requirement. Um, so were you actually seeking out a recycled material for the project or was that just kind of a really fortunate opportunity that one came up? I think it was it was more a case of the opportunity. Um, you know, as I said, we weren't um, we weren't necessarily aware of it. The bike, the bike, the bike, um, protective bike tra treatments really brought our awareness up to that. And so we were really um, pleased, as I said before, to be able to um, also apply a recycled product that was locally manufactured. So it just ticks so many boxes, um, you know, to get the right outcome. And the other thing is the, the material itself, as I understand it, is totally recyclable as well. So you know, at the end of its use, you know, life, if we do end up going back and putting in something more permanent, then, you know, that could be repurposed into, into something else, depending on what the need is at that time. Yeah, sounds good. And when we um, spoke the other day, you mentioned that the what you were taking out, the product that was currently in there, that's going off for recycling as well, which is great. Yeah, so we're removing a lot of the old rubber curbing and, and actually a call out, you know, we, we're trying to hand that over to whatever, um, if there's anyone out there on the call today that has, has any need for maybe shredding, shredding some um, old rubber curbing, um, we're happy to hand that over. We're trying to use it as much as we can as maintenance spares and other purposes. So please reach out to me and I'll uh, next time I'm taking any out, uh, we're happy to hand it over free of charge. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I can see we're coming up to the sort of 20 minute mark. So Cheryl, I might get you to pop back and see if we've got any audience questions at the moment. Yeah, we've got a couple and I think Great. Mitchell stole mine, but then Les also partially <laughs> answered this. But um, Asking if the curbs can be recycled, which you've just mentioned they can, do you have any idea of what products those materials could be used in, in that recycling process? Would you recycle them back to curbs or are You're there talking other about the, the composite comp the current curb. Yeah, the new one that you're putting in, the composite oh, plastic one and glass. I think, I think it's really a case of, you know, looking for the needs. And, you know, I, I think probably the, the team at Orca are more... Um, a more well placed to have that discussion with. I know, you know, they develop a lot of different products. As I said, I, I hadn't thought of it until I spoke to Alan recently that he said, yeah, we're looking at maybe making pavers out of the same materials for, for paths. There's, there's no reason why, you know, from a council's point of view, there might be other, uh, I haven't really thought about it, what their needs might be, but, you know, they could be, could be um, curbing stones, could be something with the parklets that are being put out there at the moment to, you know, to support, Trading, uh, dining, I should say. There might be things like they might be able to utilise them within parks. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's the point is anything a concrete unit can do, um, this could do just as well. So just to keep that in mind as well. Is it easier to mould than concrete? Or I have, I'm not technical, so I'm just wondering. No, nor, nor am I. I, I left that to the Orca team. I just, I just said, this, this is how many units we need in this time frame. Can you roll them out for us? And then they, um, they make it happen, I suppose. So uh, that's something that um, I'm sure that if anyone's got any specific um, questions, uh, um, again, as I said, um, Ellen, and, Ellen and Ken, I'm sure will be able to assist. Um, we have a question from Mary Xavier. Has Orca undertaken something similar 
internationally or is this innovation designed to suit Australian weather conditions and comply with Australian standards? Again, that's a question for Orca. Um, but, you know, I, I'm not aware of what they're doing in relation to other installations um, overseas. I am aware that they had some um, interest shown in this product from interstate in recent months, but I'm not sure whether there's, that extends to um, any overseas examples. And from what I understand from what you've just been saying, this pretty much was customised to your needs, wasn't it? Yeah, from the point of view of the shape, it basically was the same, the same material that was used for the, um, for the protected bike lanes. And as I said, my the research that we did on it, they, the product was developed a couple of years ago um, in collaboration between Walker and Deakin University. And they went through all the various tests and um, in, that, in that regard, like compression tests, and I think skin resistant tests, et cetera. So, um, again, depending on the use, I'm sure that Orca could provide the required specifications depending on what the purpose would be for use. Are there other suppliers out there or at this stage are Orca sort of the main supplier in this type of product? Um, that's probably an interesting question. I'm sure there might be other suppliers that probably have, they might have comparable or, you know, products out of, you know, recycled rubber and other materials. We really wanted to um, move quickly on it. And that's where we know that City of Melbourne had already, we had the luxury of City of Melbourne having it installed for a number of months. And then we also had a little section in William Street of the tram curbing installed. So we really felt there was no reason, and it was a time factor, but there was also, there was no reason to sort of change something that we, we saw or was working well out in the field. So um, we went with this product. Great. Um, well, and as you know, we're in, our job is to encourage people to recycle more and suppliers to experiment. And um, so it's great to hear that they're also looking at doing some tiles. So are they, do you know much about the tiles or is that a, an Orca um, question? I think you said pavers, not tiles. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's my understanding. So it's, it's just something that I understand they might be, you know, expanding on um, using that same material in that application. But, you know, I'm not here to sell Orca's product. <laughs> I'm here to talk about the, the, the value that, you know, we've actually achieved in the CBD in, um, in some way addressing safety. One of the things that, you know, we, in our, the other lessons learned is that in order to fast track this application, we found that we had a lot of, if you go out there, you'll see a lot of corridors, particularly Burke Street, which has got a lot of red paving and that's sort of highlighting the conflict points. We're trying to reduce those number of conflict points to try to have fewer openings um, while still maintaining some circulation in blocks. It's probably just another point I wanted to make. So, but um, having said that, it's still it's still a better outcome um, from a tram driver's point of view, where you can actually cite a potential conflict point rather than you know most of the uh, incidents previously were occurring with. Um, unexpected U-turn movements, you know, when for no reason the car would be travelling alongside and then they just turn without any warning in front of a tram. So at least this way we know where those points of conflicts potentially are and the driver's got more, more tram driver's got more awareness of um, potential danger at those points. So will this be rolled out, and you, uh, sorry if I missed this, but broader than the CBD? Um, we're currently working on more design plans for some more corridors. And I think outside of the CBD, that will really depend on um, um, the state's um, desire to progress some more, some more business cases and funding. I think we're all looking to um, the first three corridors to see how successful they are. And as I said, to date, they've been really operating really well. So there's no reason why we wouldn't want to um, continue on that, um, that opportunity. That's it's a really good test case, I think, having it done in the city, because that's where I'm guessing you've got, well, I think you said before, that's where you've got sort of the most um, incidents. So if, you know, it's a product that works quite well in the city, then there's no reason mm. that anyone would have any kind of issue with it being rolled out um, in any other council areas. I would have thought so. And as I said, you know, we really thought about um, permeability. So, you know, we set it back from intersections and put in the lower curb to allow for large vehicle swept paths, even semi-trailers can come around the corner before they hit the, the orcas. 
Um, we put in 1.2 metre gaps every six metres. So we've got like footpath permeability. So, you know, people crossing the road does, don't have to necessarily step over the curbing. They can walk through the gaps. So, um, and they're frequent every six metres. So all of those sort of elements um, sort of consider other users of the street, but still give us a safety benefit of the corridor. Mm, fabulous. We have got another question, but it's um, about recycling plastic from a council municipality. So I think we'll get in touch with Roshank later um, and we can probably have a chat about that. Um, but it's great that you're asking because we need you to come to us so we know what's going on out there. Um, I guess there, that looks like the questions at the moment. Um, so if this, is there anything else that we've sort of missed, Les or Lauren? We think we covered it. I think so. Yeah, it's, look, it's great to see the work mm -hmm. Yarra Trans are doing. You've got a fabulous amount of um, recycling going on. And, throughout our series and next year, hope we'll explore some more things you're doing. Sorry, Lauren, I cut you off. No, 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 not at all. I was just gonna say it's um, really fantastic to see the work that Yarra Tramps is doing, even though there's not that Recycle First requirement um, yeah. in Yarra Trams. So yeah, really great to see. Yeah, that's fabulous. Look, thank, I'd like to thank everyone for attending. I'll just um, share my screen for next week's session. Um, here we go. So next, next week um, on the 10th of, whoops, wrong one. <laughs> can you see this proper screen? I can see it. Okay, great. Because yep. I've got a few things coming up here. Um, so next week on the 10th of December, Priscilla Mocker will be talking about the use of recycled content in every layer of the pavement for the M80 Ring Road upgrade. So we'll have Sam Witterbeen from MRPV along to have a chat about that. And they've done quite a bit of recycling. And again, the M80 doesn't have a recycled first requirement as yet. Um, the project was started before those requirements were happened, but the project has been using quite a lot of recycled content. So again, it's great to see people stepping out into that sort of recycling and sustainability space. And we'll look forward to catching up with Priscilla and Sam next week. And any questions that you want to forward to our email, ecologic at roadprojects.vic.gov.au. Questions or comments or any further information, please send us an email. And I'd just like to thank Lauren and Les for today's session. It was great. It's great to learn about what you're doing. And um, we'll all be looking at the, the curbing that's going on in the city now. So <laughs> it creates a bit more of an awareness, which is fabulous. It does. It does. Okay. Thank you. Thanks Liz. very much. And thank you, Les. Thanks. Thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Cheryl. Thanks for attending. Bye. Bye.